Let's play a game. I'm going to name one person of a friend duo, and you do your best to guess the other partner of that friend duo. And you can type it out in the chat, or you can say it out loud with whoever you're watching with. Let's start easy. It's Batman and Robin. That's right. For those of you Nick Nickelodeon fans, here's a throwback. It's Keenan and Kel. Now, if you love the show Friends, any Friends fans out there? It's Joey and Chandler. Now, this one, there's multiple answers to, but really there's, there's really only one answer to this one. How many of you love the show The Office? It's one of my favorites. So it's Michael Scott and... Dwight Schrute. And then you have the unexpected friend. It's Martha Stewart and Snoop Doggy Dog. How about that one? And my ultimate favorite, it's Woody and Buzz Lightyear. Now, in fact, I feel a song coming on. Would you sing with me? You got troubles, I got them too. There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. We stick together and we'll see it through. Cause you got a friend in me. Say what? Say you got a friend in me. Forgive me for the lack of auto-tune. That's why they don't let me sing around here. But that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Friendship. The kind of friendship that God wants for all of us. The kind of friendship where our friends become part of our family and they become our tribe. The people that stick together with us through the good times and the bad times and when the road gets rough ahead. That's what we're going to be talking about today. So how do we develop those kinds of friendships? Friendships with a purpose. Because here's what I know. Every friendship ends up somewhere. But few friendships end up somewhere on purpose. Meaning we can allow our friendships to naturally happen by default, or we can intentionally cultivate relationships with a purpose, the kind of relationships that God wants for us. And that's God's heart for us, that our friends become like family and they become our tribe over time. God wants us to cultivate people in our lives that move from friends to family over time. And here's why this topic is so important, and here's why I think it's so close to the heart of God. Because there's an epidemic that we live in. We have never been more connected in our world, and yet so lonely and alone at the same time. Uh, in fact, there's a study that pointed out that two in five Americans report that they feel that their social relationships are not meaningful. And one in five say that they feel lonely. Now, 61%, here's another study, 61% of young people between the ages of 18 and 25 report being seriously alone. This is why we need the kinds of friendships that are deep and purposeful and meaningful. Maybe you can relate. Have you felt lonely during this season, especially the season where we're finding ourselves increasingly isolated from people and having a shelter in place? Maybe you can connect. And it's not that you don't have people around you. You have people around you all the time, but yet on the inside, there's a loneliness that you feel, and we feel alone. That's not God's heart for us. Uh, there was another study conducted in uh, Alameda County, uh, led by a social scientist out of Harvard University, and they tracked the lives of 7,000 people over nine years, over a span of nine years, and they discovered that the most isolated people were three times more likely to die than those with strong relational connections. Think about that three times more likely to die than those with strong relational connections. And people who had bad health habits, such as poor eating habits or smoking or alcohol abuse or obesity, people with poor um, health uh, habits, but strong social ties lived significantly longer lives than people with great health habits but who were isolated. In other words, it is better to eat Twinkies with friends than to eat broccoli alone. That's good right there. But the point that I'm trying to make is what people need, what we need is people. 
We were wired for relationship. God wired us to be relational beings. In fact, I want to show us throughout the Bible how God values friendship, how God values family. In the story of creation, way back in the beginning in Genesis, God created everything that exists out of nothing, and he said it was good. He looked at it and he said, wow, this is awesome, this is good. And then he created Adam. And when he looked at Adam, the first man, he said, well, there's something that's not good. And he said, the reason why it's not good is because Adam was alone. And God created for Adam, the first family, a companion, because God values relationship and he wants that for us as well. And we see this play out even in wisdom literature throughout the Bible. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter four, uh, the writer tells us this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And then we see this in the New Testament as well, in the life of Jesus. One of the very first thing that, things that Jesus does when he steps onto the scene in the Gospels is, is he doesn't perform a miracle. He doesn't preach a sermon. He invites 12 guys to follow him, and they become like family. That is why God cares about our friendships and the relationships in our lives. There's a verse in Psalm 68, and it's in verse 6. It says this, God places the lonely in families. And I think that's God, God's heart for us. He doesn't place us in loneliness. He places the lonely in families. And maybe that's what you're feeling right now. You're, you're feeling lonely. You're feeling alone. Maybe you're new to, new to the city or your family lives in another state. And right now you're feeling that loneliness on the inside. Or maybe you're around people all the time, but you still feel lonely. And you end up beating yourself up and you start questioning, why am I feeling lonely? And you tell yourself, you should not feel lonely because after all, I mean, you have great personality and people love you and you're charming. In fact, people say, you're so charming, you need to be on The Bachelor and you're so talented and you have a great career or you've built a successful business or, or you're, you've turned organizations around. There is no reason why you should feel alone and yet you feel alone on the inside. I want you to know you're not alone. And God wants to place the lonely in families. See, because loneliness and alone is the devil's plan for you. But friendship and family is God's heart for you. And let me just let you in on a secret here at Newbreak. Our agenda, yes, our agenda is that you discover authentic community and you become part of the family. Why? Because God places the lonely in families. I love what Proverbs 18 verse 24 says, and I'm reading out of the message translation. It says this, friends come and friends go, but a true friend sticks by you like family. I love that. And in that verse, there are two different Hebrew words that are used to translate the word friend. And the first Hebrew word is a word that is simply translated an acquaintance. People that you, people, someone that you may have interacted with once, or they may be a Facebook friend, but they don't know you and you don't know them on a deep level. And then the second Hebrew word used for friend in that verse, it carries this idea of a deep and loving and intimate and a soul kind of relationship that you have with a person. See, here's the thing. Acquaintances, they will know your name, but your tribe and your family, they will know your soul. And God wants us to have soul friends. See, soul friends are like, refrigerator friends. They're the type of friends that they, that they walk into your house and they open up your refrigerator and they help themselves. It's just a known thing because they're your refrigerator friends. They literally take the expression, mi casa es su casa. It's not an expression for them. They take it literally. They're, your house is their house and they'll eat your chips and salsa as well. See, your soul friends, those are the friends who will pray for you. Those are the friends that are committed to your spiritual growth. Our, our soul friends, those are the friends that will sit with us and mourn with us when we're sad. 
They're the friends that will celebrate our successes on the other side. They'll celebrate our successes and there would not be a hint of jealousy or insecurity in our successes. Those are the soul friends that God wants to cultivate for us and in us. But here's a disclaimer. Relationships and friendships are messy. And the reason why they're messy is because we're imperfect people. And, and when it, wherever there, is, there are imperfect people, there is bound to be a certain level of messiness. We're broken. We're sinful. And when it comes to friendships, some of us have been on the receiving end of hurt, and some of us have been the cause of someone else's hurt. This is just the reality of friendships. But there is beauty and there is power in friendships with purpose because those can become catalysts for deeper spiritual growth in our lives. I like to think of it this way. I love to shop at the outlets. And so some time ago, I got a pair of jeans that were on sale. They were like 50% off. And I was like, yes, amazing. I mostly like to shop at outlets because, you know, I, I love a good deal. So I got these pair of jeans. They were half off. They were amazing. And one day I'm, I'm doing laundry. And I noticed that on the inside tag, there was, uh, it read slightly imperfect. Now, some stores, they use phrases like as is or slightly irregular to describe products like that. And it's their way of saying, hey, here's a product and um, there is a flaw in this item. But we're not going to tell you where the flaw is. So it could be a stain that will not come out. It could be a zipper that, won't, that would not zip. Or it could be a button that would not butt. But we're not going to tell you where it is. And if you're looking for perfection, this is not the store, this is not the aisle, and this is definitely not the item. Now, when I think of us and relationships, all of us on the inside of us have a tag. We all have a tag that reads slightly imperfect, slightly irregular, as is. So when it comes to relationships, relationships are messy. Friendships are messy, and yet they are so powerful in the hands of God. So how do we develop friendships with purpose? Now, let's go into our Bibles to Romans chapter 12, and we're going to start reading at verse 9. And we're going to hear the words of the Apostle Paul, where he talks about what makes a powerful community, what makes relationships and friendships thrive. Now, what's interesting about the Apostle Paul is that uh, he did not have a, a blood family as as we know it, but he was excellent and he was um, great at developing friendships. In fact, whenever we read his letters in the New Testament, he spends a large portion of his letters, typically at the end, acknowledging and honoring some of his closest friendships. And there's usually a whole bunch of names at the end of his letters. And that is a testament of how good and how great he was at developing friendships. So if there's anyone that we can learn from about developing friendships with purpose, it is the Apostle Paul. Now here's what he has to say in Romans chapter 12, verse nine. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor. Honor one another above yourselves. Verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now, here's the thing. Here's what Paul is saying. These are characteristics. This is the glue that makes community and friendships thrive. Here's what makes them purposeful. So for us to develop meaningful and purposeful friendships, if you're taking notes, we have to commit to giving our best to our tribe. We have to become the friend that we're looking for. I love what he says in verse 10. Be devoted to one another honor one another above yourselves. I love those two words, be devoted and honor. Those are powerful words and they're critical to a thriving and beautiful friendship. 
I think of the word devoted, and devoted carries this idea of the thing that I give my attention and my intention towards. So the thing that I give the best of my intention and attention towards, that is the thing that I'm devoted to. And for some of us, it's golf. Or for some of us, it's surfing. Or for some of us, it's our jobs and our career. For some of us, it's our kids. But the thing that I give my intention and attention to, that is the thing that I am devoted to. And the Apostle Paul is saying that when it comes to friendships, we have to give our best by being devoted to our tribe and our friends. I like to think of it this way. I am a devoted soccer fan. That's right. My favorite team in the world is the greatest team in the world. It's an English team known as Manchester United. Now, I love them. I've grown up following them and watching all their games whenever I have access to watching their games. But because they play in the UK, um, their games are typically broadcasted here in the US, sometimes at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. Let's just say, you know, during the times where no one wants to be up. But when it comes to Manchester United, because I am so devoted to them, I will wake up at 4 a.m. to watch their game live with a coffee in hand and ready to go because I'm devoted to Manchester United. But if you ask me to prayer walk with you at 4 a.m., I'll be like, okay, I'm going to pray under my blankets, and how about you walk? See, there are things that all of us are devoted to, and the Apostle Paul is challenging us that if we want to cultivate friendships with purpose, we have to be devoted to our friends. The second word in that verse, verse 10, is the word honor. And this word honor, it's a powerful word in the New Testament. In fact, it's used about 41 times in the New Testament. And the word honor carries the idea of attributing value to something. And so in the first century, in Roman culture, people would give honor based on someone's achievements or based on their social status. And it was a way of kind of of separating, you know, the, the different classes of society and the different classes of people. But Paul here, he goes against the grain of first century culture, and he says, that's not how Christ's followers behave. We don't honor people based on their achievements. We don't honor people based on their wealth, and we don't honor people based on their social standing. We honor people because they are people created in the image of God, and we honor people because Jesus did that for us. Jesus honored us with his life and his death and his sacrifice while we were yet sinners. When we achieved nothing, when we deserved nothing, Jesus honored us with his life. So Christ followers, you do the same to everyone around you. That is the power of honor. See, there's a difference between respect and honor. Respect is earned, but honor is given. So the way I honor somebody is when I, when I, when I treat them as, they were, as if they were more important and more valuable than myself. And here's what I know. When it comes to honor, this is something that we all can do, and it's how I give my best to my relationships. So let's get really practical right now. How do we cultivate these these friendships with purpose? I want to give us five B's that will move us in this direction uh, so that we can develop friendships with purpose. The first B is this, be present, be present. Because here's the thing, every friendship, every relationship for that matter, requires our presence. And we cultivate friendships, not thumb to thumb, but face to face. Have you ever um, maybe had dinner with your family and in the middle of dinner, you lift up your head and you realize that everyone's on their device? Yeah, it's happened to me a lot of times. See, that's not how, that's one poor way of developing friendships because we develop friendships when we're present, when we're fully engaged. I heard one person say it this way, that love, another way to spell love is T-I-M-E. And if we want to be present in our friendships, here's another great tip. We need to learn how to eliminate, we need to eliminate this word from our vocabulary. We need to get together soon. 
we need to get together soon. How many of you say that? How many of you are guilty of that? Well, I'm guilty as charged. I say that way too often. We, ne we need to get together soon. And soon never happens. So if we want to create purposeful friendships, we need to be present. The other way, one of the other ways that we can be present in, in, in our friendships, too, is through our generosity, through our resources, through being generous with people. I'll never forget it. Some time ago, uh, Kelsey and I, we, um, we were in a season of transition, and we were trying to figure out what God would have us do next from a ministry perspective, from a job perspective. We didn't know if, if God wanted us to stay in San Diego still or if he wanted us to move elsewhere. And so we packed all our furniture, all our stuff into a storage unit and just were kind of waiting on what was next. And I'll never forget some dear friends of ours, Kim and Eric, love them to death they invited us to stay at their house for six weeks and those six weeks were some of the richest uh, uh, experiences and memories in Kelsey and I's life and every day they would pray with us and they would encourage us and they would remind us that God still has a plan for you guys and I know that you guys are in transition and it's hard to know what's next but God hasn't forgotten you God hasn't abandoned you God is with you and God will show you what's next and in those six weeks we began to see the hand of God moving and the doors that he began to open and how he began to provide even in the midst of us and I look back on that time and I was so challenged and I'm so grateful for them, but I'm so challenged to do what they did for us for somebody else in the future. That was them being present. Now here's the second B, be authentic, be authentic. This is about being true to who you are and how you're feeling. This is about being true to how you're feeling and not pretending because here's the thing we can become professionals at hiding our struggles we can we can wear masks at church even even when we're not wearing masks we can become professionals at hiding our struggles and what's really going on on the inside and pretending to be okay when everything around us is not okay. And we get so good at this that sometimes we can even use Christian jargon. I call it Christianese. We can use Christian jargon to mask what's really happening on the inside. We say stuff like, hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm anointed and appointed. I am called, forgiven, and chosen, but not frozen. See, we have all the, the jargon and the vernacular to mask how we're really feeling on the inside. But it is authenticity that deepens relationship. I'm uh, so blessed. And one of the things that Kelsey and I are so grateful for is people in our life group, dear friends who have walked with us, that we've walked together through, uh, through pregnancy and childbirth and, uh, and raising our kids. And these are friends that sometimes I could go to and say, you know, guys, can you guys be praying for me? Because I'm really having a hard time being a good husband right now. Or I'm really having a hard time with my parenting right now. I feel like I'm doing a really, really poor job in these areas. And these are people that I can go to and I can pour my heart out and I can, I can expose myself and how I'm really feeling on the inside and know that it is safe and that they're for me and they're praying for me. See, we need to have authenticity in our relationships. Here's, I've heard it said like this. One person said it this way. We impress people with our strengths but we connect with people through our weaknesses. Now, the third B, if you're taking notes, be accountable. Accountability is, is an environment or it is the environment where love and grace exists and truth can be spoken in that environment of love and grace. And that truth that is spoken into our lives, it can be spoken in such a way that there isn't judgment attached to it. And here's the thing, our tribe and our deep friendships and our soul friends, they will speak the truth to us even if it offends us and even at the expense of us getting upset. And the reason why they do that is because they love us and they care for us and they want to see the fullness of what God is going to do in our lives come to fruition. We all need those friends that'll say, hey, what you did there, that was kind of inappropriate. You know, the, the, the way you spoke to your spouse, 
that was kind of condescending. Hey, the way you treated your staff or your, uh, or your coworker, yeah, that was kind of rude. We need those people who will speak truth into our lives because they love us and they care for us. Uh, the fourth B is this. Be wise about who I include in my tribe. Be wise about who I include in my tribe. I love how Proverbs 12, verse 26 puts it. It says this. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. The implication of this ver verse is wisdom or wise people, they choose their friends carefully. Here's why. Because our friendships, our friends determine the quality and the direction of our lives. Now, if you're a teenager maybe and you're listening to this and I know you've heard it from your parents and you think they're antiquated or they're old fashioned and you know, they say stuff like, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You know, those statements, there's truth in there and there's wisdom behind that because our friends determine the quality and the direction of our lives. So here's a great um, rubric to adopt when it comes to being wise about who we allow into our lives. We are to be friendly to all people, but we are to be, and we are to be friends with many, but we're to be family. See what I did there? Friends and family, family. We're to be family with a few. So friendly to all, friends with many, family with a few. And the last B, the last B is this, be the friend you wish you had. See, here's the thing. We all are great at listing out qualities that we want in our friends. But here's the thing. What if we worked on becoming the friend that we want to have? In other words, what if we looked at the qualities that we want in a friend and we began to develop those qualities in us and then we became or we practiced those qualities to someone around us? See, that's how we develop purposeful friendships. In other words, if we want, if we want a friend who's patient, what if we developed patience and we demonstrated patience to those around us? What if we wanted, if we wanted friends who were kind, what if we developed kindness, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, and we were kind to those around us? We want friends who are encouragers. What if we learned how to encourage other people on a daily basis? We want friends that are good listeners. What if we learned how to ask good questions, not just yes or no questions, but good questions? Hey, we want friends that are caring. What if we were intentional about caring about the people around us? What if we took notes of their names and their kids' names and their hobbies and their interests and the things that they love to do? That's how we develop purposeful friendships. I heard it said this way, if you go looking for a friend, you're going to find that they're very scarce. But if you go out to be a friend, you'll find them everywhere. And here's what I know. We all can do these five Bs. I heard this story of a six-year-old kid in Georgia. And on his first day of elementary school, he wanted to do something different. I don't know if you remember your, the night before your first day of school. I mean, you would pick out your, your clothes. They call them outfit these days, outfits these days. But you'd pick out your outfits. You know, you're, you'd make sure they're ready. You'd lay them out on the bed. You know, because you wanted to make an impression the next day. You wanted to look your best and you wanted to be confident going into your first day of school. Now, this six-year-old boy by the name of Blake, he wanted to do something different. And so he asked his mom to make him a shirt. And it wasn't a superhero shirt or it wasn't a shirt of his favorite basketball team, the 76ers. It was a shirt that said, I will be your friend. That's right. A shirt that said on the front, I will be your friend. And the reason why he wanted that shirt is because in kindergarten, he had experienced being bullied and he had watched other people be bullied. And so he wanted to do something different and he wanted to make a change. And in his mind, the, the way I make a change is by being a friend to someone else. And when finally they asked him, Blake, why is it that you wanted that particular message on your shirt? 
This is what he said, six years old. He said, I want people to meet. I want to meet people right where they are, just like Jesus does. I want to meet people right where they are, just like Jesus does. Here's the thing. Remember that someone needs your friendship. Someone needs your friendship. So when it comes to developing friendships with purpose, what's your next step? Maybe your next step is to simply pray for the friends in your life, to intentionally pray God's blessing and God's best and God's direction and God's grace for them. Maybe that's your first step. Maybe your step is, maybe your next step is to maybe reconnect with a friend that you've lost connection with during this COVID season. Maybe that's what God is calling you to do. Maybe your next step right now is to join a life group because it is in life groups that we discover the depth of community, that we pray for each other during the week. It's my favorite part of my life group. We get to pray for each other during the week. And it's amazing how as we're journeying together and praying for one another, we begin to see God answering those prayers that we've been praying for each other. It's so powerful. Maybe that's your, your next step. Or maybe you're listening right now and you're going, I'm good. I have a great group of friends and we're purposeful and they're like family. They're my tribe. Here's my challenge to you. There's someone else who needs your friendship. And my challenge to you is to, is to adopt an open chair policy instead of a closed door policy because somebody needs your friendship. I will be your friend. And ultimately, when I think of those words, I think those are the words that Jesus says to all of us. In fact, in John 15, verse 15, here's what Jesus says. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. And maybe that's what you need to hear today. Jesus calls you by name and he calls you his friends friend. So before Pastor Carter leads us into a time of communion, where we remember what Jesus did for us, I want to pray for us and for our friendships in our lives. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of friendship. Thank you that it is your heart for us to develop soul friends, friends who would challenge us to grow and to become more like you. Father, and for some of us, maybe we're gun shy. Maybe we've been hurt by a friendship from the past and we're extra cautious, Father, or we even put up guards, Father, so that we don't put ourselves in those kinds of situations again. So Father, I pray that you would give us courage to pursue those friendships. God, for people who are experiencing loneliness right now, I pray that you comfort them and that you bring people into their lives to encourage them and give them hope. So challenge us to deepen our friendships because that's what you use to grow us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.